Now, Sarah's going to stay just for a minute, uh, maybe longer than a minute. And uh, I, I'd always wondered which of my boys would, like, become a, outspoken, you know, a speaker, you know, that kind of thing, be on the platform, sharing, and those kind of things. Little did I know God had something a little bit different in mind. And uh, as we started the Daniel plan, some of you wondered why I even got interested in that, why I thought God was moving in that direction. And what I saw in experience of God, how many of you take an experience in God? Okay, I've taught that class over 10 times. One of the best courses I've ever taught. And I've engaged with God and experienced God in great ways personally. But I've seen it happen over and over again in people's lives. And so as I thought about the, what was happening in our congregation, I noticed many of the young families, and I consider Sarah and Lance in the young family department, uh, becoming very interested and this particular subject to do with health of the body, the mind, the spirit, all those kind of things. And there was like a little movement going on. And if you haven't noticed, it's going on in our communities. Have you noticed how many people, uh, when you start talking about organic, and 10 years ago, if I'd have said gluten, you would have not known what I was talking about. It would have been a different, different language. But you notice in our culture that there has been this, this movement and this attention giving that we're whole people, that we're not only a spirit, but we also possess a body. And we as Christian people understand the principle that God has given us our body. Did you know your, your body's a gift from God? And we're to take care of it, and that your body does affect your spirit. And so as I looked in the congregation, I saw this movement, and then about the same time, I saw that there also was a movement within the church to focus on this very thing. And so uh, one of the, the families that was affected was in my own family. And uh, Sarah has gone through some changes, not only on the inside, but the outside. And uh, so I asked her if she would consider, and it's, have you ever, it, it, if you don't think this is not easy, then you can come up here and you can speak. But uh, she's going to share a little bit about her journey in the form of a testimony. The Bible says that they overcame him, who's him? The evil one, by what? The blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives even unto death, the scripture says. So the, the testimony of a Christian is a very powerful thing. It just attests to the power of the blood of Jesus. And she's been on a faith journey, and I wanted her to share a little bit about that today. So I give you Sarah, my daughter-in-law, in whom I'm well pleased uh, this morning. God bless you, Sarah. Thank you. Amen. Oh, excuse me. So you all got to meet my family, um, and that's, it's, we didn't, like when we set out on all of this, it wasn't a really grand master plan to have the testimony happen on the same day as the baby dedication and it all happen on Mother's Day. Like it kind of all just happened to be on the same day. But it's actually really um, appropriate because my journey with my health and my body revolves so much around those two little girls. Um, some of you know some of the story, parts of the stories of their existence. Um, when we had Anna, um, that was an act of God in more ways than one. That she um, came into existence, that God sustained her at her birth, that God saved me at her birth. And um, we thought it was just incredible that God gave us another one. And that's, I mean, again, that's just... God blessed us even more. We thought it was great that we got to have one. We didn't know we were going to get to have another. And, um, and God gave us Callie. And um, the interesting thing about, I guess, that ties those two together, other than the fact they're my kids, is in both circumstances, God was trying to teach me something. And that is, I am Lord of your body. And, you know, we struggled with infertility. I am Lord of your body there. I am Lord of your body when they're born. I am Lord of your body when you get pregnant again. And you would think, hearing this kind of being told to you time and time again, you'd get it. I didn't. Um, I, um, at, after Callie's birth, Callie, um, I spent almost the entire time on bed rest. It was another very difficult pregnancy. Not in the same way, but it was very hard. Um, so you would think, after two pregnancies, um, 
that I would have gotten it. Um, but in my heart of hearts, even after Callie was born, even seeing another child brought into existence that, for our, for as far as we knew, shouldn't have been here, um, that I would get it, that he was Lord over our physical bodies. Um, I had spent the first part of my adulthood um, feeding any whim, eating what I wanted, um, and if it tasted good, I ate it. Well, I didn't just take a bite, you know, you eat the cake kind of attitude. Um, and um, just generally living an undisciplined life, just, just undisciplined, no um, pacing, no uh, sacrifice, no looking forward, saying, well, I'm going to eat a meal, maybe I shouldn't eat the cake. I'm kind of using that as an example, but there just was a general undisciplined behavior, my day in, day out, what I did, how I carried myself, um, and that kind of thing. Um, this was my body. We hear that a lot in popular culture. This was my place. Um, in a sense, I was autonomous. Um, nobody was going to tell me what to do with this body. I mean, that's, that's a very prevalent pop culture thing, and it, it had even invaded my own, um, my own mind and my own spiritual walk. Um, and so that was kind of the backstory before I even, we even wanted to have a kid. And um, in hindsight, I can see that God was really trying to get my attention by letting infertility pass through his hand. Um, and I, you know, it was Romans 8, 28, you know, that God calls all things, um, you know, for, for my good if I'm called according to his purpose, you know what I mean? And, and so I can't say that the infertility was all bad because I know what God was trying to do through that period of time, even though I didn't give him credit for it. Um, and so he let us, he finally let us have a baby. Anna came, it was a rough pregnancy. She came very early. It was very scary and dangerous for both of us. And so you'd think I'd have gotten it, you know, that God actually controls my body. Like, he can. He can reach his hand in and prevent things from happening, and I didn't get it. And he gave me three years. There's three years between those two girls, and you think three years would be enough time for him to say, for, for me to get it. I control all of this. This is within my sovereignty. And I didn't. And so in this time, instead of preventing a pregnancy, he allowed one. <laughs> And, um, and from the beginning, like I said, I was on bed rest. And in his mercy, he did not let me get the full consequence for my sin, for my, my gluttony, for my, uh, my hard-heartedness, that I didn't want him there. I didn't want him in that part of my life. Um, because he could have not let me have kids at all. And um, he, I mean, and, and in many cases, it's not always the case. Sometimes there's just unexplained infertility. But my health played a significant, a very significant part in that. I mean, doctors were telling me, you know, well, you need to get healthy, Sarah, and maybe you'll have a kid kind of a thing. Um, my weight was over the obesity line, and yet I was still blessed. I was exhausted and moody, but I was blessed. Um, God began to slowly, and this is after Callie was born, he finally started to show me kind of, um, I think I finally took the responsibility of a parent a little bit more serious, you know, that they're watching how I behave. And if I'm being undisciplined and if I'm cheating on snacks between meals, how on earth can you expect a child to wait and eat their vegetables if you are not behaving the same way? I mean, just really. Um, and I got this verse, Proverbs 15:32. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. And I just kept hearing that. You know, I needed to be, I needed to grow in discipline. If I wanted my children to become what I, what I knew God wanted for them, I needed to be a little more disciplined. Um, so ever so slowly, I, I was making changes. It wasn't big stuff, um, but I was just a little more conscious of what I was doing. And now I'm going to refresh your memory on what um, Sam preached about last week because those six points were exactly what I walked through about a year ago. I did them kind of out of order, but if you do them in the right order, it works better. Just saying. Um, the, first, the first and second step, I had committed, I had decided to be disciplined. 
Um, I had to think about it. I had to think ahead. I had to plan ahead. You know, um, it's really hard to eat well when you have no well food in your house. You know, like, if there's no vegetables in, how can you eat a vegetable kind of a thing? Um, the next thing that happened was I kind of skipped to point four, which is you get group support. Um, out of the blue, um, many of you know um, the Prestons. Now, and many of you also know that Aaliyah and I are stuck to each other like glue. God gave us that relationship. It's, that's another testimony. Um, she approached me what felt like out of nowhere. She said, I'm changing my diet. This is what I'm doing. What do you think? And I said, well, so am I. We hadn't talked about it. It just kind of happened. Um, and it could not have been chance that independent of each other, that God had placed the same topic on our hearts um, around the same time. And without a formal agreement of like calling each other any specific thing, we loved each other. And we kind of unspokenly agreed to hold each other accountable and to help each other and to share and to work together at this because we both had health problems that needed to get fixed. Um, and so when Aaliyah, and eventually that group added, it's not, a, now I stand with several other women that um, I'm so thankful for them because, I mean, just to pick on the Monday night uh, uh, Bible study I lead, was about a month ago, or Easter, I had so much Easter candy in my house. It was, it, it was ungodly. And I, I came to them Monday after Easter, and I said, you guys have to pray for me. I'm not saying it to be funny. I'm saying there is so much sugar in my house right now. I cannot be the glutton I want to be. This is a full-out addiction. I wanted to just eat the whole jar of candy right then. Like, it was all I could do to not do it. And again, but that's that whole, to have people around you that can pray for you in those those situations of temptation. I'm not saying all candy is bad for you, but what I am saying is eating the whole jar of candy in one sitting is not the best choice. Um, so, you know, I did point four, which was um, get help, get group accountability. And then point five was, was love, that your life fills up with love. And at that point, it was. I had so many people around me that loved me and were encouraging me to keep on keeping on. Now, my husband, God bless him, has been married to me for almost 10 years, and he was no stranger to any of this. I mean, he lived with me. Um, but, um, you know, it's like those people that are closest to you, you don't really listen to, you know, like your parents and your, your, your husbands and your wives. It was that kind of thing. He knew exactly what was going on, what needed to fix, but I had a hardened heart. I wasn't listening um, to my husband. Um, but after, after step five, which is the... Um, the love, um, I, I kind of hit this breaking point. Um, it was minimal commitment and not a whole lot of change. I knew all of this knowledge. I knew what was good for me, and I didn't. I, I applied it, but like half-heartedly. You know, I didn't really want to chase after it. I thought that if I just, you know, bought the vegetables, that it would work. You know what I mean? That that kind of attitude. Um, but the problem, the problem with somebody who is absolutely addicted to something is there comes a point where you keep giving them grace and you keep giving them grace. And they're, it's not true for all situations, but at some point you have to kind of cut it. Um, and, um, and I realized this, that yes, I bought the vegetables, but if I was on vacation, I might eat cake three times a day, and like it, the, the heart hadn't changed. I wanted to be disciplined, but my heart was still kind of on the fence. Um, and I desperately wanted to be disciplined and say no, but I seemed to lack the willpower. In 1 Corinthians 6.12, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And that was another verse that God had just, I mean, I kept hearing it. It was like I heard it everywhere. You know, am I allowed to eat? Is anybody going to stop me from eating the whole jar of candy in one sitting? Probably not. Is it for my benefit that I do it? Is it permissible? Is it beneficial? And that was kind of the measuring stick that God had given me. Is it beneficial? Um, and kind of moving forward. And I looked this over, 
And it was at that point that I cried out and said, I need a heart change. That it's not enough for me to go through the motions and eat the vegetables, but, but my heart wasn't there because I would still, like I said, if given the opportunity, I would still fill my body with junk. You know, it, the heart, my, my attitude towards food had not yet changed. Um, and I'm going to confess something that probably Lance only knows, but um, you want to know the biggest thing that was hard for me in giving up this idea, whatever I want to eat, I will eat. And it was fear. I know it sounds so silly. We live in this day and age where we are so blessed in America. We have paychecks. We have grocery stores everywhere. Like, we, we do not have a shortage of food. We have so much, so more than what we need. Um, I love, 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 love to cook. Love cooking. And I had spent the first several, I mean, I'm not saying I'm wonderful at it, but I had worked hard at becoming good at cooking. And I was up to this point where I was like, oh, if I change all this, what if I don't get to cook the way I want to anymore? I know it sounds small, and there's some people that are like, please, don't make me cook. But for me, that was a big deal. It was like, what if I don't get to do this how I want to do this anymore? That was the lordship issue. Who was he going to be lord over my body? And furthermore, I wanted my food to taste good. I don't know which came first, the love of cooking or my food to taste good. One of, but they feed each other. You know, if you want good food, eventually you'll learn to make it yourself because you want it again, that kind of principle. So um, I had to get over it. And I had to get over it, but only by changing my heart. My heart had to change. And um, I, was, I was afraid of not feeling satisfied. Not satisfied like, like, um, like content, but like, you know that feeling when you have your favorite meal? And maybe, maybe not so much gluttony, but just you've eaten it, or you've eaten it, you've eaten it, and it feels good, and you're full, and you're satiated, and you're like, now I can move on to the next thing. I was afraid that the food just wouldn't do that, you know? If I was just going to be starving all the time to do this right. Um, and then again, God gave me a verse that I, when I, when I gave this over to him, he gave me this verse, and it's, it's been such a promise, and I keep coming back to it. Romans 8, 32. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, won't he also give us everything else? I had been saying that he couldn't meet my need that he couldn't keep me full, that he couldn't let food taste good. I mean, good-tasting food, that, that comes from God, too. He gave us a tongue. He gave us a sense of smell because he wanted us to enjoy food. It wasn't, this isn't somehow sinful to enjoy good food. Um, but I had, to, I had to rely on him that, yes, it meant I had to practice self-control. Yes, it meant that I had to be disciplined, but he was going to meet me there and he was going to carry me even to the next meal. Um, because if he gave up his son for me, why wouldn't he give me everything else? Why wouldn't he? He loved me that much. Why wouldn't he? Um, I needed to trust him. And I trust him. Um, and it was a decision. It, deciding, you decide to trust somebody. And then you make the effort to follow through. Um, and so, I went cold turkey. I cut out a lot of stuff, um, and came back to God when I was tempted, came back to God and said, I need my health, my body, if I continue this way, I will meet an early grave, and um, it's my responsibility even, God had convicted me that, uh, much like Sam said last week and the week before, that this is the body, this is the tool that he's going to use, and how dare I cut my life short because of something I could have done. I am limiting him. I am limiting him with my health. I'm not letting him use me as much as I could if I'm only going to live to 35 versus 70, 80, 90. It was life-changing. Um, I saw the addiction to food for what it was. Um, and that's that whole appraisal. That's the point number four which is um, uh, to, to look at, to be honest in your assessment of yourself. Um, I saw my heart change, 
And I'd been holding on to this part that I wanted to be autonomous, I wanted to be my own adult, I wanted to be me, I was a grown-up, I could eat what I wanted, nobody was going to tell me what to do, that kind of attitude. And it was prevalent in other areas too, but the food part was where he got my attention. And again, just this transformation, this renewing of my mind, the God that made me bought me. And I had to get off the throne. I'm not in charge of me. Um, I am not autonomous. We are not supposed to be. God did not make us to be lone rangers where we go through life by ourselves. God made us to be with our maker and to be with other believers. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. And how dare I disregard the thing for which he paid so highly for. And that was, that was the, you know, that God would meet my need, but that also he gave me this body to honor it and to use it appropriately. And this is how I learned to live out Romans 12, 1 through uh, 2, and that, uh, those verses. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And I had to give up my body. I had to let him be king over it. I couldn't give in to all the whims and all the, all the whatever I wanted. That's not why I'm here. I'm not here on this earth to just get whatever I want. That's, that's, not, that's not why God made me. This is not for my pleasure. It's for his. And um, I followed the idea that you, you do what feels good and you alone determine your destiny. And I was a believer during this period of time, but this was not a part that I had given over him. And I had followed it for the better part of a decade, and it got me nowhere. I, continue, I, might, I would lose weight for a little while, and then I would go right back over. It was this yo-yo. When I let God be God and change the way I think and trusted him to meet my desire to have food that tasted good, I know it sounds simple, but it was really um, overwhelming my life um, and feel full, I found myself spiritually and physically transformed. Um, I want to read a quote that I got out of going through experiencing God um, that really, to me, sums up um, what what God did through this period. God is not looking for ways to make you squirm. He does, however, want to be Lord of your life. Whenever you identify a place where you refuse to allow his wordship, that is lordship, that is a place he will go to work. He is interested in absolute surrender. God may or may not require you to do the very thing you identified, but he will keep working until you are willing for him to be Lord of all. And that is what God has been doing over the last decade in me. So... That's what I have to share. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. And bless you. Mm -hmm. Well, praise the Lord. And uh, certainly appreciate that. I think it speaks to all of us. One of the things that's been helping me to look at things differently is... Uh, to try to think about this in a way that relates to me the most. And some of you know that I'm a builder uh, by trade. And so this whole thing about, you know, body health and my spirit and being submissive to God and letting him have first place in every area of my life uh, is not easy like it's uh, for you. So God had to speak to my heart in kind of a, a way, and I want to say this to you. He may have to speak in a unique way to you because some of you are sitting here today and you're thinking, I'm perfectly fine. There's not a whole lot that I really need to do. And the fact is, you're just not being honest with yourself. Is it all right for me to tell you that? Uh, so uh, the way I had to re relate to it a little bit for me was is that uh, I'm a builder, and so I was thinking of food as building materials. How many of you would like me to build you a house with inferior materials? Would you like me to do that? You know, that I would go out and I'd pick out some rotten studs and 
you know, when we poured the concrete, we wouldn't put very much Portland in it. We'd put a lot of sand. How would you like to live in that home? Pay full price for that home, knowing it, it was inferior in every way. After a period of time, what's going to happen with that house? Have any of you bought a house look good on the outside? But underneath, somebody scrimped. Somebody cut corners. Interesting thing, I was in the backyard and I was uh, picking up some pipes. And I had taken some pipes out of it. So I can relate like with building material and I can relate like with pipes. How many of you got pipes in your house? Anybody got pipe in their house? I got pipe. So I had taken out a bathroom uh, and I had some of the parts left over. I scrapped the metal. I picked up one of the galvanized pipes. People complained that none of the water was going down the drain. We had to replace the whole bathroom area. And I picked up one of the pipes, and I know why. Does anybody tell me when I looked into that galvanized pipe what I saw? Well, it had all corroded on the inside. It was rotten. And I couldn't understand how any water got through those pipes. Now, do you know you have pipes in your body? That you have plumbing? Some of it goes to your heart. Some of it goes where? To your intestines. Have you ever had a clog? <laughs> And you know what it feels like. And so I start thinking in my mind in a way that can relate to me. And this is my prayer, that God speaks to you in a way that relates to you. Some of you are young, but if I were to ask the number of people that are having health problems right now to raise their hand, you'd be astonished in this room. Are those that are having trouble with heart, those that are having trouble with lungs or breathing, those that are having trouble with uh, a number of other diseases, and I believe it has a lot to do with the building materials, don't you? And so let's consider that, and I want us to be healthy. And what I want to do, I know that it's Mother's Day, and I'm going to do this very quickly. Some of you are saying, sure, Pastor. I don't believe you at all about that. But I'm going to try my best. Because last week I talked about what it takes to change, what it takes to change. And this is bigger than food. What Sarah said today, you can apply to any addiction. If you had an alcohol problem, was that good advice? Okay? If you, if you had a problem in the area of sexuality and an addiction, would that advice help? Absolutely. If you had an addiction to drugs, or if you were in a lot of a different situation, it's all kind of the same. It all runs together. And so, uh, thank God for his principles. And today, what I want to talk to, I think it's going to be helpful to moms, just very quickly, is to talk about... Uh, why you need to set some personal goals. Why you need to set some personal goals. Now, the first thing I want to say to you is this. The first thing I want to say is, is this. Is that goal setting is a spiritual discipline. How many of you know that God set some goals? Any of you know that? As a matter of fact, it says all of life and all its history is moving to a certain goal in God's mind. And so from the beginning of saying, let there be light in Adam and Eve and all of the human race, the Old Testament, New Testament, it's all moving to a what? To a goal. When you play basketball, what do we call that thing that you throw the ball through? Anybody know? We call it a hope, but we call it what? It's called a goal. When you play hockey, you are going to hit the puck into the goal. If you are into many sports, they have a thing at the end of the football field. It stands up at the end. Isn't it curious? It sticks into the sky. And when the guy who kicks the ball, what is he trying to do? Get the ball through the goal. So God has goals. And he's moving all of history. And we can go back and we can look at all the Middle Ages and we can look at, you know, the Babylonians. We can look at the Egyptians. We can look at America. And by the way, America is pretty new on the scene, isn't it, in comparison? Did you know he's moving all things to a certain goal? And we need to understand what that goal is. And this is his plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. So what's the goal? Now, isn't it interesting that in Sarah's life, or in my life, when it comes to my spirituality and my health, what is the goal? Is it going to be accomplished in your life or mine? That we would come under what? The authority of Christ. And I'll tell you, 
there'd be a lot of people I wouldn't want to be under the authority of. Can you say amen? But when I think about Jesus and how he lived and how he loved and how he died and rose again and wants me to be with him forever and eternity where there's no more suffering, no more pain, that's the person I want to be under their authority because of his love, because of his mercy, because of his grace. And so are you under the authority of Christ in every area of your life? Are you submitted to him in your married life? Are you submitted to him in your body life? Are you submitted to, to Jesus, our Lord? So God has goals. Goals focus my energy. This is what they'll do. So is it wrong for a person to have some goals in the area of their health? Or would that be a helpful thing? For you to look at your situation and to say, you know, in order for me to get healthy, I probably could set a goal like I would like to lose this amount of weight by this amount of time. I want to tell you what it'll do. It will focus your energy. Now, there are a lot of uh, things that I think that are not worth setting goals about, but when you think about focusing your energy and you think about bringing glory to God, you've got to think about what's most important. And you say, what is a spiritual goal? Now, God has created us for the purpose of this, and I want you to say it. Purpose number one is we are to worship God. Let's say that. Purpose number one is to worship God. That's number one, to bring glory to him by worshiping, honoring him, expressing your love to God. Is that more important than your job? Is that more important than your wife? Yes, that's more important than anything else. You may think that you had a failure in a day, but if you gave glory to God that day, you were a success. Amen? Your boss may have not thought you were successful, but if you got up in the morning and you honored God with your life and you expressed your love to God during the day, that was a successful day. Can anybody do that? Can you do that when you're in a wheelchair? Can you do that when you're on the front lines? Can you fail to do that? Yes, you can. And so worshiping God is very important. And then the Bible says we're here to be discipled. We're to become more like Jesus. Is that a worthy goal? Yes, it is. How are you going to do that this year? When was the last time that you read a book? When was the last time that you set a goal and said, you know, I'm going to read the New Testament this year all the way through? Now, this is an interesting thing. If you have no goals, guess what's going to happen? If you have no goals, somebody tell me what's going to happen. You're going to waste this year. You're going to waste your life. Now, you can either waste your life or you can spend your life or you can invest your life. Which one do you want to do? Do you want to waste it? Do you want to just spend it on something? Because you're going to give your time and energy to something. But it's really amazing when you don't have any goals. You know what happens? It's you just drift. And this year comes, and next year comes, and you accomplish very, very little. And then you have regrets, and then you pine. Oh, I wish I hadn't wasted that time or that money or those resources. And so setting a goal will focus your energy. I do not run without what, the Apostle Paul said. A goal. I fight like a boxer who is sitting something, not just the air. He's not shadow boxing in his life. He realized that Christ put him here for a purpose. Has Christ put you here for a purpose? I'm telling you what, it's not to waste your time, and it's not to shadow box. You want to do the real thing, right? And so, do you have some goals for discipleship, for fellowship? I met with a bunch of men at our Sleeping Giant study. A couple of guys have connected relationally. And that means outside of church, can you imagine this? They're calling one another. They're praying for one another. They're supporting one another. They are interested in one another. And this, I could see the smile on their faces. They found a good thing because they found a brother in the Lord who cares about them and they care about that brother. What does the Bible say? Two's what? Better than one. As a matter of fact, the Bible says a person walking alone is a pitiful thing. That's what the scripture says. I need you. You need me. Do you have any goals this year to connect with any people? Because all of life is about what? Loving God 
in loving other people. And if you're not going to love God this year, you're not going to love other people, you missed the goal. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus said what? That was the greatest commandment. He said a second's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you have any goals this year? You know what can happen more and more? Is you can find yourself locked up in your house, going to work, coming home. You can go uh, through your business, and before you know it, you're on the Internet, you're watching TV. This day rolls in the next day, rolls in the next day, rolls in the next day. I want to ask you, at your funeral, do you have six close friends that are going to carry your casket? Or would that be hard to find someone? Amen? And if you're going to have those kind of friends, you're going to have to what? Invest your life in other people. Do you have a plan to invest your life? Some people say, I'd like to see more lost people come to Jesus. How many of you would like to see more lost people come to Jesus? If you don't make it a spiritual goal this year to reach out to some lost people, to even know some lost people, guess what's going to happen at the end of the year? You're going to sit there and say, Lord, I didn't reach anybody this year. Well, you didn't reach because you didn't want. You'll never hit the target if you don't have one. Does that make any sense? And so ladies and moms, i got to tell you, for you this year as a mom, what, what would be a spiritual goal as a mother that you would have? I see on cards all the time, this is what I see. I would love for my children to come to know God and follow him. Now, mom, what is your goal this year? What is it? Do you have a goal that you're somehow going to reach out to those children because God wants to use you in their life? So is it a goal in your life? Don't just be boxing at the air. Aren't you glad the Apostle Paul started all those churches with the help of the Holy Spirit? Aren't you glad that he wrote the New Testament? He didn't even know he was doing it. But his goal was what? I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his suffering. And he was following hard after Jesus. Is this a year where you're going to make it your goal to follow hard after Jesus like you've never done before? And if you don't set it as a goal, guess what's going to happen? It's never going to happen. So goals are something God does. God fo goals focus your energy. Make the most of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days, the Scripture says. And we certainly live in, in evil days. The next is this. Goals stretch my faith. They stretch my faith. I want to ask you very bluntly. Do you have something that you are planning or even dreaming about, and I use that term loosely, because you can have a dream, and you can wake up the next day, and guess what? That dream will never become a reality until you do what? You get up, get out of bed, and you go after it. Can you say amen? And too many of us are dreamers. We have big ideas, but we do very little about making those things come to fruition and God wants to help us in that and so goals stretch my faith a good goal for you to have is a goal that if God is not involved and God doesn't come through it'll never happen and this is what I'm asking you do you have some God-sized goals in your life or are you just doing what you can do in your own strength and power Jesus said, you can do all things through what? Paul said, excuse me, Christ who strengthens me. I feel a lot of people have apathetic lives. They just want to get by. I hear, I can't wait till I retire. What does that mean? What are you going to do in retirement? Does that mean, okay, I don't have to go to my job anymore, and now I'm going to sit by the swimming pool, and I'm going to sip lemonade. How much lemonade do you think you can drink? And how long do you think it's going to be before you get bored with golf and shuffleboard? God forbid, right? 
you got to have some God-sized kingdom goals. Who wants to see Jesus rock this community? I mean make an impact on this community that people would see God move at Cross Point Church. Well, I'm going to tell you what, we've got to come up with things that are bigger than ourselves. Can you say amen? And you say, Pastor, we've already done some of that. I believe all around us miracles are happening, don't you? Seeing people saved, that's, that's impossible. People don't save themselves. The Spirit of God is involved in convicting the heart and bringing people to himself. It's amazing to see the life changes. I see some of our new believers, do you notice what's on their face? A smile this big because they're getting to know Jesus. That is awesome. How many of you want to be a part of that? Change lives now and forever. But I just got to ask you, are you involved? Are you a part of it? Have you set any goals? How about becoming a church member? It's real easy to slip in and out of services, not be involved. And when is it going to be time where you're going to say, no, I'm going to commit to membership in that church? Or I'm going to get busy working in that church with that pastor. He drives me crazy sometimes. But I want to get involved. How many of you are tired of sitting in the stands? It is time to get in the game for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the greatest game that this world has ever known. Can you say amen? And what are we going to give to it? Just just a a half-hearted effort? Are we going to give it our all? I press The Apostle Paul says, goals stretch my faith. Are you involved in something that only God can do? According to your faith, it will be done to you. Everything that does not come from faith, if it doesn't take faith, if you can do it yourself, if you're sure you got it covered, it doesn't require any faith on your part. What does the Bible say? It says, that's a sin. What you're saying is, I am independent. I am autonomous. I set my own goals I can achieve it myself. I don't need anybody else. I just need me. Isn't that the kind of spirit that separated man from God a long time ago? And we need to be careful of that. It can infiltrate your life and my life. Goals build my character. They always will. Paul said, I do not claim that I've already succeeded or have already become perfect. But what did he keep doing? He kept striving. He kept pressing toward the goal for which Christ Jesus had won me to himself. Christ has a goal. God has goals. We should have goals as we seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you, are you status quo? Some of you are veteran believers. Are you? Submitting yourself to Christ. Are you giving it your all? Is that your goal this year? Or are your goals, I want to make sure that my 401k is there. I want to make sure that all my insurances are paid up. I want to make sure that when I, when I finally get there, whatever that means, I'm going to be safe and secure, and I'll be able to live and do whatever I want every day. Is that the spirit that's in your mind? You know what I love to see? I love to see people in their retirement, they knew more for Jesus than ever before. Can you say amen? That's a good use of your time. Before you had to fool around with work, praise God. Now you can go to work for the Lord, make a real, real difference. And I really appreciate some of our people that are dedicated that way. That's what I want to do when I get old. (laughs) Amen? (laughs) Praise God. Goals give me hope. If you don't have anything to look forward to, how many of you, one of your goals, don't tell your kids this, it's a secret, all right? How many of you would love to see your kids find a dedicated Christian spouse? Praise God. More than them making millions of dollars, they find a Christian man or a Christian woman. I'm already praying for Callista and Anna and have been. That when the time is right, God's will be done. They find a dedicated Christian man who loves the Lord. I'm praying for that now. Is that a good goal for a grandparent to have? I'm praying for my Anna and my Callista that they come to know Jesus at the 
earliest ages possible. So when they come to grandma and grandpa's house, guess what we try to instill in them at almost every turn? Yeah, because I want to influence them. Do you have some goals as grandparents? They may not always be realized, and it's not always easy, but you have hope. Can you say amen? You have hope in your heart. You have something to work towards. Never, never give up. Job said this. He lost his kids. He lost his health. He lost his possessions. He's sitting in a situation that's not easy. He says, I do not have the strength to endure. Why? Why was he ready to give up? And you could understand this man, couldn't you? Could you imagine if a house collapsed and killed all your kids? And left you with a wife who said, curse God and die. Now he was thinking over that, wasn't he? And he understood her duress. But the fact is, he said, it's like I've lost my bearings, God. Because it seems like everything I thought was a goal is gone now. Was it? God had to show up at the end, didn't he? And to show them, listen, I've still got a plan and I've still got a purpose for your life. You do not know that I am using you to, to teach the angels a lesson forever. In all of humanity, how many of you read the book of Job? How many of you are grateful for what you found there and have benefited because it gives explanations to suffering and why good people go through bad times. But he didn't know, but God had a purpose. Some of us can be like this. He lost his bearings. I do not have a goal that encourages me to carry on. But this is what Jeremiah tells us. The plans I have for you are plans to prosper you and not to harm you. They are plans to give you hope and a future. God wants us to have hope. God wants us to have a future. And when you set some goals, those are some things out there for you to look forward to and to have hope in. What kind of goal does God bless? What kind of goal does God bless? Godly goals, the kind that God blesses, bring glory to God. Are there lots of good goals? Yeah, there are. But not all of them are going to bring glory to God. And I want to ask you to sit down and evaluate your goals. Is that goal going to bring glory to God? Or is it going to bring glory to me? Whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink, you do it all to the glory of God. Can eating a meal be an act of worship? I didn't hear you. Can eating a meal be an act of worship? How so? How so? Can you sit there? Because this is where it comes from. I'm going to spell it out. G, if I spell it wrong, correct me. Okay? G R A T I T U D. What's that spell? Give me a G. Give me an R. Give me an A. Give me a T. Give me an I. Give me a T. Give me a U. Give me a D. Give me an E. What's that spell? Gratitude. gratitude. If you can eat a meal and give gratitude to God, have you just brought glory to God at your dinner time? When was the last time you sat there and took, I took an orange the other day. How many of you are amazed at oranges? You're taking your oranges for granted. I can tell a lot of you did not shake your head. You did not shake your head. Is an orange beautiful? What color are they? Orange. Very good. Very good. You peel back that skin and what do you find on the inside? A replacement for chocolate. Amen? I mean, a whole lot more oranges than I used to. I had one piece of chocolate all week long. Give God the glory, okay? Praise God. I didn't need that. Do you know why? I've been hungering more for the orange than I am now for the, for the chocolate. And I got that orange. I said, God, thank you for making oranges. Thank you for what they look like and that little veiny stuff that happens all over them. 
and you peel them back, and they come in slices, and there's like this beautiful symmetry. Have you ever seen that? You pop that thing open, it's segmented. You put one of those in your mouth, bite down with me just for a minute. Give glory to God. Suppose God made our food taste like dirt. But man, how has he made our food? All kinds of colors. Can I give glory to God when I eat my food? Can I give glory to God when I drink? Isn't that what the scripture says? Yeah, I can. You know what it will do? It will transform your meal time. And you know what is a real neat thing? Is after you get done, you ought to give some gratitude for the people who made that stuff. Can you say amen? It doesn't have to be mundane. And you don't have to do it at McDonald's. Is it all right for me to say that? Go and cook at home. Amen? Help your wife prepare it. Have some fellowship. You see what I'm getting at? Your whole life could be different. And it has to do with gratitude and attitude. Can you say amen? Do you notice what changes in Sarah's heart? Attitude. That's what changed. It'll make all the difference in the world. Praise God. Can I go and do my exercises and just be going, oh, this is so hard for me to get down and get up and do my stretches for my back and do this, that kind of thing. Or can I go with an attitude and say, God, thank you for giving me this body. How many of you are grateful for that body you got today? You got fingers that work. You got muscles that are pump. You can lift up heavy weights. So when you're doing your exercises, do what? This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made, right? You'll be a lot nicer to live around than you wake up, oh, oh. who likes to see a guy like that? Give me, give me, a, give me, give me, this, isn't that true? How many like to see a wife walking around half dead? She's a lot of fun, right? You know, we want to have energy. We want to have those kind of things. And I'm telling you, uh, it's a shame. Some of us can't do this. Okay. Godly goals, the kind that God blesses, are motivated by love. Why should I keep my body in the best shape that I can? For my God... Amen? I can serve him longer. I can serve him better. And how's about for my family? For my wife? My wife wants me to be around a while. Do you know why? That's a good thing, by the way. That's a good thing. You know why? Because I can be helpful to her. And so do I take care of my body for my wife? Absolutely. Do I take care of my body for my children? Do I take care of my body for my grandchildren? Do I take care of my body for you? Yeah. So it's all about what? It's all about love. I love you, so I'm going to take care of myself. So I can be the best I can be for you. Let love be your highest goal transforms. It's not about me. Godly goals fulfill one of God's purposes for your life. Do not use any part of yourselves to sin or to be used for wicked purposes. Instead, give yourself to God and surrender your whole being. Does that include your body? To him be used for righteous purposes. And so I've got to take care of my body so this body can be used for righteous purposes. So I can help feed the poor. Some of us are going to take our bodies after the service and we're going to the Presbyterian home. Do you know why we're going to the Presbyterian home? Because there's some moms there. And some of those moms will never get a visit. But some of us are taking our two legs, our two arms, and the rest of us, because it's a complete package, right? And we're going to go over there and we're going to bless those ladies. Could we pray for them here? Oh, Lord, I pray for the, the ladies at the Presbyterian home that are moms and maybe no one's going to visit. Would they ever know? But if I take my body over there and I bring a rose, right? 
I walk into a room. I use these lips to talk to those ladies. I use these arms to embrace them. Is that going to make a difference? Yeah, it is. Keep your body in good shape because you can do that. Paul said, I run straight to the goal with the purpose in every step. He ran straight ahead. He knew what the goal was. He didn't get caught up in distraction, didn't go to the right, didn't go to the left, ran after the goal. And by the way, will visiting the nursing home bring glory to God today? Yes, it will. And by the way, you could go too. Now, my wife is going to go home because on Mother's Day, she cooked for a bunch of people. <laughs> Isn't that the way it goes? <laughs> you know? Her husband's going over to the Presbyterian home. We checked two cars. After I get done, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to enjoy Mother's Day with my wife and my family. And uh, godly goals are set in faith. Without faith, it's what? Impossible. Please, God. You say, I can't do it. I've tried. I reach for goals. I continue to fail. This is where your faith comes in because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And godly goals are achieved only with God's power. That's our problem. How many self-help books do you think there are? On the internet, it says there's 867,000 self-help books available in print now. Would you say that's a lot of advice? That's a lot. 867,000 self-help books in print right now. Lots of advice. Advice is good. How many of you have gotten advice from your wife, from your husband, from your neighbors, from your doctor, from whatever? Advice is good. You know what the problem is? is we don't have the power to do it. You know who will give us the power? God alone can give us the power. That's what you need. That's what I need. And this is in closing. We can make our plans, but the Lord does what? He determines our steps. Goes back to what Sarah said. You will not succeed by your own. Let's, let's read this together. You will not succeed by your own strength or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Any goal you set, you're going to need the spirit of God to help you to do it. And will he? Will God supply the power to bring glory to himself through your life? Absolutely he will. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Sink his will in all you do, and what does he guarantee he will do? He will direct your path. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for, Lord, these babies we've dedicated. Praise the Lord. And there is a goal for these parents to bring them up in such a way that they will see Jesus and come under his authority. It seems like it's very simple. God is moving all things to certain ends, and how we thank you, Lord, for that, that everything would be submitted to his Son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're a God of goals and that we, too, are to set goals in our lives. And as we look through that today, Father, in giving you honor and glory, Father, we thank you that you will give us the power to bring glory to yourselves while we're in this mortal body. So we love you today, Lord, and... For someone here who doesn't know Jesus, what I've spoken about is they have advice. They may have even set some goals, but they really don't have God in their life because they have not submitted to Christ. And Lord, that's what I pray today, that there would be men and women and boys and girls that would see their need for Jesus, the need for his love, his mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness. And Lord, that they would willingly say, Jesus, would you please come to me? Would you please come to my life? Would you please forgive my sin? And this day, I relinquish lordship of my life. I want to stop being the chief executive officer of all my affairs. I want to stop being the boss. Because, Lord, I, I really am not the person I should be or could be. And so I admit I failed in many ways. But today I turn it all over to you, and I ask you to be Lord. That's what you are. But it's personal today between me and you. Forgive me, save me, grant me new life, and give me the power to become the person 
that you always wanted me to be and that I always wanted to be because I'm lacking that, because I'm lacking your son and I'm lacking you. So today I turn it all over to him. For, for the rest of us that are believers, we've got to really assess who's in charge here. And I pray today, Father, we will get off the throne of our pride, of our arrogance, because in it, some of us are really hurting ourselves, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And help us, Lord, to make sure that we give way to you, that we yield to you, and then, Lord, use us. Empower us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.